Hello and welcome to All Things Aviation. Have a really great edition of it today where we actually are gonna focus on the helicopter industry. I'm pretty excited about it. Long time fixed wing pilot, but big fan of the whirlybirds, uh, the rotorcraft as we like to call them. So, uh, and I have a great set, a panel today, a great set of guests, both professional and uh, um, those that are striving to become professional pilots, I should say. So it's gonna be, uh, be a lot of fun to, to talk with everybody. Um, this is a program that is designed to encourage the next generation in aviation, also to give them some guidance on what path that they might take in terms of where they are, whether they're currently in school, which one of our guests is, or they're, they've already graduated and they're still working on their ratings and everything, and they are trying to figure out what path or which way they want to go. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce everybody. Before I do that, I, I, I wanted to say that uh, I think a lot of times people take helicopter flying for granted, but it's a huge part of our life. So just as an example, within the last week or two, or actually last several weeks, uh, specifically this week, we've heard on the news about helicopter rescues uh, and re with regard to the, the tremendous uh, amount of fires that are going on and people that were trapped. And thanks to the, the National Guard and other services out there, uh, they, I believe they rescued almost 400 people, pulling them out uh, via helicopter. And, and that, I'm sure our pilots here can tell us a little bit more about that, but that, that's some very difficult flying. You're flying in smoke and, and with flames around and you're trying to maneuver and your visibility is low, et cetera, and so forth. So they are to be admired for that. But on, a, on an everyday basis, we have helicopters that are doing everything from news coverage and law enforcement, of course, a lot of medevac, um, power line surveys, hoisting, search and rescue, and, uh, and of course, VIP transport in the corporate world. And that's just naming a few. Uh, when you see who are, hear who our guests are, they'll, they'll tell you, ah, Vince, you, you just, you just uh, it's the tip of the iceberg. So let me introduce our professional guest first. Uh, we'll start with Stacy Sheard. She is the board chair of the Helicopter Association International Board of Directors, better known as HAI. She's also a corporate captain for Fanatics with Executive Jet Management, and she currently flies an Augusta AW139 uh, in the Northeast region. So welcome, Stacy. Thank you, Vince. We have Jeff Smith. Jeff and I go way back. We, were, we met through MBAA, uh, National Business Aviation Association. Jeff is the chief pilot of helicopter operations for ROP Aviation. That's a corporate operation. He has been heavily involved in advocacy for, for the helicopter industry, for heliports, for airport access, et cetera, and so forth. He was, he's, uh, he was with the Eastern... Uh, Helicopter Association, I think if I said that correctly, Jeff, as well as he currently sits on the board for HAI Helicopter Association International. Welcome, Jeff. And last but not least, we have Christine Yaroschuk. I hope I pronounced that right <laughs> after, after practicing it before the show. She is a pilot with the Maryland State Police Aviation Division, flies primarily medevac, but their missions also include search and rescue, law enforcement, hoisting, and VIP transport. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. And our aspiring young aviation professionals, we have Connor Langelar. He's currently a junior at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. He is studying aeronautical science, I believe, and is uh, in, in the midst of helicopter flight training. And so we'll hear more about what his goals and interests are as, as it relates to the helicopter industry. Welcome, Connor. Thanks for having me. And we have Summer Martin. So Summer got her Bachelor of Arts in Communication from UC San Diego in 2016. She's currently a 
private helicopter pilot. She's working on her instrument and commercial ratings. And most recently, she was doing client relations as a, a, as a, she was working as a client relations manager for Jet Effect in Van Nuys. And welcome, Summer. And then we have Melissa. Melissa Schantz is a, has her Bachelor of Science in Aviation Administration from Utah Valley University. And she currently works as an aeronautical analyst for Aeronav Data, which is now part of Garmin International. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Melissa, did I pronounce your last name correct? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and get things started? And, and, and I'd like to really start with Connor, because Connor is the, the junior of the three that we, uh, the three aspiring young aviation professionals that we have on the show today. Connor, why don't you tell us a little bit more about how you got into helicopter flying and what your interest is as you wrap up things in the next year or two at Embry-Riddle Prescott? Um, well, how I got into it is after high school, I moved to uh, New York City, actually. And uh, I spent a lot of time just watching the helicopters land over like the Hudson and Pier 9, I believe it is, or one of the heliports that are right out there. I was like, that's something that's really cool and interests me. And then I'm also a big outdoorsy guy. So I love being outside and I love everything that has to do with that. And so something that I've always wanted to do was actually get into like a heli skiing or heli biking kind of operation. And so after seeing helicopters land in New York, I was like, yeah, this is definitely something I want to do. So I started looking around at different schools and I saw that uh, Embry-Riddle Prescott, I can get a degree as well as go and get my ratings all the way through CFI. And so I applied and I got in, I was like, sweet. This is really cool and this is a really good opportunity. So I'm gonna go down to Arizona now and try my hand at helicopters. And so far it's been going really well for me. I'm really enjoying the training that I'm getting here. Um, the school really enjoy it as well. And it's been a really good opportunity and I think I made a really good choice with where I wanna go with my life right now. So I'm really happy with what I'm doing. So do you have a question for our professional panel? Um, well, I was kind of wondering in terms with building hours, is going the CFI route and doing the flight training route a good idea as opposed to um, possibly joining up with the military? And I'm Canadian, so I was considering joining the uh, Canadian military and flying helicopters for them for a few years as a way to build hours um, after I complete my CFI rating. So my question is more, do you recommend moving into a military environment for a few years to gain that hours and gain those that, gain that experience or stay in just the uh, civilian area and just continue to work as a flight instructor, try to find a tour agency or something and build my hours that way? Military pilots, anyone? I have to tell you that when I took up aviation, I was too old to risk not getting aviation having joined the military. Because I think when you join the military, you don't say, I'll go there, but I really want aviation. Otherwise, I'm not coming. Is that, is that how that works? No. Well, you want to go, Stacey? Or? Um, go ahead, Jeff. I'll go ahead. All right. So, um, so I, I knew that I was going to be a helicopter pilot when I went into the Army. Um, so the different programs, and I don't know how it is in Canada, but, um, the army itself, if you don't have a college, if you don't have a college degree in the, in the United States, you cannot go into any of the other, uh, branches as an aviator. You can only go enlisted because they only have op commissioned officers as pilots. Uh, the army on the other hand has warrant officers, which uh, at some point during your career, you will have to have a two-year degree, then a four-year degree for advancement. Um, but you don't have to have it. In fact, they still have, to this day, a high, uh, not, not necessarily a high school to flight school, but they have a direct entry program, which I think is like 19 years old. Um, I can tell you it was the best experience of my life being in the military. I know some really phenomenal people. I had some really great uh, people uh, commanders uh, and a lot of different experiences. But to answer your question, though, uh, to go into the military to build time, the experience is wonderful, but it's not the same experience as flying civilian. But the time building is not going to happen in the military as fast as it would if you continue down the CFI track. If you, if 
you figure out what you want to do. And if you want to be a civilian uh, pilot, then I would, my recommendation would be continue down the CFI, CFII, and you're, you would build hours much faster that way. Yeah, I, I um, you know, I, I think it depends on the situation and the Canadian military is, is much different than the U.S. military. Uh, so I would, I, I think the best answer here is for you to connect with um, some helicopter pilots in the Canadian military. Um, and I don't know if they have them in all branches, but I would connect with someone in every branch that they have helicopters, definitely. Um, and I would talk to them about how many hours they have and how often they fly and what life is like and deployment and things like that, just to see if that fits you. And situationally, because of the you know, COVID pandemic right now, you, you may find yourself in one position or another um, and everybody's route is different. So um, I would get as much information as you could from the people doing those jobs and I get their input and their advice and not just one person or two people, I would get a lot of people and, and take this advice. Um, it's the same on the civilian side. If you're going that route, especially if you're going back to Canada to fly, um, it's a different system. It's a different instruction system there as well. So uh, you could find yourself in a seat right away flying. Um, it, you know, so it just depends on who you know. Um, you um, definitely are doing the right things. You're going to Heli Expo, maybe Heli Success, all of these events to network. You need to keep doing that and, and definitely connect with anybody in the Commonwealth military. So if there are opportunities that happen to be, I don't know if you have Commonwealth ability to do Canada or Australia or different militaries, I would look at all of those options that you have. Your situation is, is special. And I think that it would take an individual touch to it to find out more info. And if you need connections like that, uh, there's certainly on LinkedIn and on Facebook groups, there's, you're gonna find somebody if you go checking around for information. Connor, did that answer your question a bit? Uh, yeah, that made, that gave me a couple things to go look towards and a couple things to, little paths to follow. And I really appreciate the answers from both of you. Thank you. Great. So Stacy, you've had, you've flown a, a, a variety of different, you've done a, a variety of flying, different types of flying. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and some of the flying you've done and, and, and the difference between the types of flying that you've done in a helicopter? Uh, sure. I was, um, I was um, active duty military for 11 years. Um, in that time, I was enlisted and I flew Hueys and Blackhawks um, before I got out of the Army. And um, then I had to learn a whole new way of thinking. I had to fly in the civilian helicopter industry, completely different. I was a newbie. I knew nothing. Uh, really comparatively. Um, I flew tours in the Grand Canyon. Then I flew for uh, an air ambulance company in Los Angeles out of Van Nuys Children's Hospital, Los Angeles. I flew some single pilot IFR corporate work. Um, and I did some test flying for Sikorsky for about seven years. Um, and these days I'm flying in the Northeast in and out of New York City, uh, flying in those same um, uh, those same heliports that Connor said he saw helicopters flying into. I think Jeff and I both fly in and out of there all the time. I actually had a flight today that we had to go ahead and cancel due to weather, not being able to get into the city. So um, it's all been so um, diverse. Um, I think every, each avenue you take and in the helicopter industry, I think there's 29 different sectors of the industry that you can take part in and every one of them is satisfying. And if, you, if you're able to do four or five of them, I think you're a lucky person. If you specialize in one area, it could be the happiest, you know, the happiest thing of uh, your life. I know Christine uh, feels that way about her job. So I think that's the goal. I think it's finding a purpose, finding something that makes you happy and variety is the spice of life. So I think the helicopter industry offers that. Are we muted? There we go. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. I feel like that commercial. Can you hear me now? Oh, the AT&T, AT I think it was. I'm sorry, Christine, I was going to say, speaking of you, you have uh, flown for the Maryland State Police Aviation Division for, I think, about 12 years. And you did a few things before that. But what led up to that and, and what made you... Uh, decide to stay with the 
Maryland State Police. So what led up to working for the Maryland State Police? Yes, your career. Honestly, I identified the Maryland State Police before I ever took my first flight lesson. So it was kind of cool that I actually achieved it. So um, I said before, when we were talking earlier that uh, September 11th had occurred and aviation was in a downturn. So when I was looking at aviation as being a possibility, that was the perfect time for me to start training, much like you're doing right now, if we're all in a downturn, now's a great time to get your certificates and get your your uh, hour requirements and things like that. So when the industry does return, you'll be ready. I mean, you'll be you'll be prime position to, to jump on, on jobs. But I was a CFI, so I built hours that way. And, and so in a nutshell, I was a student for nine months. I was an instructor for nine months. So as far as hour building, yes, you will get hours when you have a, a instructional facility that has good weather and a high student um, population. So. Those are the two things I would say when choosing a school to teach, make sure you have good weather so you're not canceling for weather all the time. Um, but when I was uh, looking for this job or when I was looking to see how I could make this work, um, the Maryland State Police has just been rock solid. Uh, the jobs of the 29, I, I can't wait for you to list them all because I'm ready to write all these down. Um, the ones that I had seen were fantastic. You could fly fires, you could fly, um, uh, I'm sorry, what, what is it when you fly for, for animal identification? Like in Alaska, you could do glacier tours, you could do any number of things, which I didn't get a chance to do because at that point in time, I was too tied down. We know what that feels like it, it, in a good way, mind you, between children and um, husband. But all it is to say, while you're young, if you can go out and do all of these adventurous things before you find the job that you can you can stay with for a long time, it works out beautifully. So after the nine months of instructing, I worked in the Gulf of Mexico flying shuttle to and from uh, oil rigs. And that was amazing. So I started in a Bell 206. I worked through an EC-120, went through a Koala. Oh, I love the Koala. It's the baby brother to the Augusta Westland. You'll notice there's a commonality. We all fly the Augusta Westland. And uh, then I wound up coming back here to the Maryland State Police to where I was born in Maryland. And um, I've been flying here for the past 12 years, almost 13. It started in a, um, oh shoot, Dauphin. So it was almost a step back. And then I came here and then, and then they switched over to the Augusta Western 139, which I'd already had 500 hours in when they, when they brought it on board. So it worked out well for me, but between hoisting, searching, medevac, every day is different. I just couldn't ask for a better job. I mean, it's just stunning. Just stunning. Yeah, to yeah that's, that's fantastic uh, to hear that from you. Summer, you have grown up in aviation and grown up around aviation and were inspired, I think you said, when you were in Seattle to, uh, to actually focus on helicopters. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that happened and, and what your interest is now as you continue to uh, mount your helicopter ratings? Yeah, definitely. So in Seattle, I was a personal assistant um, for an NFL football player, and he was also a very advocate for aviation, especially helicopters, um, and was a student pilot, but mainly to just do um, events and be able to fly places that, you know, you know, the FAA doesn't allow to fly unless you're doing some kind of training. So that was kind of the loophole to get certain things done for VIPs. Um, so he had two part-time pilots and then I would have to fly the dead legs in between. Sometimes we would drop them off and then we'd have to fly back and I would just arrange his schedule and appearances and stuff. So his pilots always were set up to, um, for instruction and dual, um, dual flying. So in the dead legs, they started, they're like, I was so, you know, always asking so many questions on flights. Cause it was kind of like a ride along always. And I was always excited to sit in the front. And so they're like, oh, do you want to fly? Like, we're just flying, you know, from A to B anyways, it doesn't really matter their instructors. And I'm like, yeah, could you give me an, like, how does this work? How do I get into it? I'm so intrigued. Um, I got, flew briefly in a fixed wing, but it just didn't have that passion behind it that I did then sitting in a helicopter. Um, so they give, gave me a couple of instruction lessons and just told me about the industry. And I immediately, you know, was like, how do, how do I do it? Who do I talk to? 
you know, where are the flight schools, you know, how do I, um, I, you know, go about this? And so they kind of showed me, you know, a couple of organizations, you know, said, you know, apply for AOPA. Uh, if you can go to Heli Expo, it's kind of expensive, but it's well worth, you know, the connections and meeting people. And then obviously as being a female pilot in the industry, they're like, you know, find the Whirly Girls and other women in aviation and female pilots, and they'll kind of, you know, tell you their path and story. So honestly, at the beginning, I maybe had nine hours or so of instruction flight, and I immediately applied to every single organization I could find from AOPA to Whirly Girls 99s, and just started talking to people, figuring out, you know, people's stories and paths. And I didn't quite understand the difference between like part 61 and 141 of flight training and, you know, just the different routes. And I didn't know what to expect at all. I'm so used to airline. I know everything back in front of airline industry. So it was just a whole different um, beast. And so, and a lot of airline pilots too, they, they talk a lot. They're great as well. They do talk a lot though. And they don't always know, you know, um, the helicopter side of things. They think it's exactly the same or similar. Um, but obviously those guys are also very experienced. So things have changed through, you know, when they went to school and stuff. So, um, yeah, just kind of, you know, like Stacy and Jeff, just part of HAI and asked my way around and went to three different flight schools actually for my private um, and now stayed at my third one to continue my instrument, but just really finding where you're comfortable. I mean, I started in Seattle, then did most, a lot of my training in Phoenix and then finished in Long Beach, California. So those are two super different um, terrains, areas, radio communication. So just kind of finding, you know, one, exposing yourself to a lot of different flying, but two, just finding where you're comfortable. Um, I felt more comfortable in Los Angeles, even though, you know, the airspace is super dense and it was kind of crazy to solo out there as a private student still. Um, but yeah, just, and then just finding the route. I mean, for me, I think I, I love, yeah, like news and tours and um, I'm not quite the firefighting adventurous um, type of flyer. I mean, I might come down my path, but I'm definitely more, um, you know, the reliable and stable um, type of flying, just, you know, having a schedule and following that. But yeah, that's kind of how I went into it. And um, I'm currently in Denver just because of COVID um, for personal reasons, but I love flying out in Los Angeles and work for Jet Edge International um, out of Van Nuys and just love being part of events like NBAA. I'm still trying to get out there if I can. And yeah, that's kind of my, my path. And do you have a question for our panel um, regarding with everything that you've done so far uh, to present, uh, including a lot of the networking opportunities you've had and everything, it, what, what direction are you thinking of taking at this point? Or do you have a question for the panel about that? Yeah, my biggest question is mostly always, do you recommend kind of going the route also like Connor was saying um, CFI and just going for hours or going do you sometimes follow aircraft type like is there if I know I want to go into news flying and there's you know news companies obviously in Los Angeles and I know the type of aircraft they're flying do I kind of to build hours to go to even apply do I kind of chase that type of aircraft to have the experience in the aircraft type or do I just, you know, CFI, you know, and little Robbie most of the time and just get hours to be able to apply and the experience? Um, how much does hours versus aircraft type and experience um, matter? And then when you're trying to like follow your career goals? That's a good question. That's an excellent question. And I think it's for, so what, what's your goal, Summer? What do, you, what do you see yourself wanting to do ultimate, ultimately? Probably it sounds silly, but like news flying or traffic flying um, in Los Angeles, there's obviously so many different companies and routes, um, but yeah, just staying local uh, and initially probably flying tours and then um, building myself just towards working with the news. Okay. The good thing about this industry is that um, what I've learned is everything I thought was my ultimate goal often changes. Um, as I, Absolutely. as I, like if you look at someone's resume, as they do different jobs and round out their skills, uh, no job you're going to do is going to be a waste. I think it all shapes you for the eventual jobs that will come your way or that you'll uh, come to. 
I think, um, you know, to, uh, to be an um, electronic news gathering pilot is, is an awesome uh, career. And a lot of people do it. And Van Nuys is, is one of the hot spots, uh, along with other areas in the world. So they fly a lot of A stars. Um, there might be st still, still some jet rangers and uh, some other aircraft that, that they also fly. But knowing that, um, I, I would definitely, you want to talk to the people doing that job first and get all of their input. That's a big one. I, if that's your goal, start making friends with them online now. And then when you're back at Van Nuys, go visit them. Ask them if you can visit the hangar and walk around and see the aircraft and have them take you through what they do and how they talk on five different radios at the same time, stuff like that. So you want to find out what it's all about. And you may never know, you might get a ride along. So uh, that would be priceless, right? So I would, um, I would look at the route they took to get there. Each one of them, did they, you know, what was their experience before they got to news and how they got there? I think that experience is of ultimate. Um, having air, that aircraft, that particular aircraft time is fine. But I know just in, in Van Nuys, if you know the area, it's ever so helpful if you know that area. Um, in New York, it's the same way. Um, we, when we look at hiring, we look at, we don't look at hiring an Augusta 139 pilot. Um, that's a nice, that's a perk. That's great. But what we need is we need a solid IFR captain that can probably fly twins and has good IFR time in twins. But the most important thing is that they know the area. So uh, the area is of utmost importance, you know, and then all the other things that go with it. Um, do you get along with them? Can you sit all day long with Jeff in the cockpit? I mean, really. <laughs> so that's kind of where it is. Yeah, uh, you have a reputation. I, yeah, so apparently. Uh, I, I, I agree 100% with Stacy. Is um, so, so typically, typically, and I'll tell you more, I'll go more East Coast to the Northeast, but I think it's a lot of different places. So, yeah, I think even down in the Gulf. Um, it, you're going to have to have some flight time. You're going to have to have experiences because most operators, no matter what mission you're doing, have to make an insurance. There's a, they all have to be insured. And right now, insurance is a very sticky area in our industry. So you have to have a certain amount of experience. And they base that completely on total time. doesn't matter how much aircraft time and type and all that. The first thing you have to have is a specific total time to be able to work for a certain operator. Uh, usually goes a, typically uh, in the Northeast, it's, it's instruction. Um, once you get to the 800 to 1,000 hour mark, uh, you'd start applying for uh, air tour jobs. Um, and those jobs uh, typically, this year's a little off, but those, year, those jobs typically are very good turbine time builders. Uh, when I first came up here, it was in 1997, I think I was flying on average of 100 and 110 hours a month. So that, and it was all turbine, I was flying AS 350s, but you have to get to these different levels to be able to branch out. Um, once I had one or two years, and the other thing, the tour industry and for the New York area, just like Stacy said, I went, uh, the tour companies also, to supplement their business, do part 135 on-demand charter. So in the summer, everybody in New York goes to New York City. They, most of them go out to East Hampton, which is about 86 miles to the east. And on a Friday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, Monday, it's a Congo line of helicopters going back and forth to the Hamptons. Um, so back to what Stacy said, it's very important for people and those operators to hire pilots, single pilot, find five passengers in all kinds of different weather by themselves, they, they need to know the area and they need to know the area very well because it's very difficult in an, in an A-star with no autopilot to pull out a sectional and you know try to fly the cyclic with your knees when you have five passengers that are sitting right next to you trying to figure out uh, if they should be comfortable because you don't know where you are. So uh, knowing your area and, and, and you already have that, you said you flew in Long Beach. So you know what the, what the uh, LA basin and all that airspace looks like. I think there's like 11 or 12 class deltas there underneath the class Bravo. 
you know, you're the only place in the country that has transition areas at 3,500 feet to get through all that. It's quite complex. So that experience is that experience is going to do a lot for you. But I agree. But and like, but back to it. You, I agree with Stacy. You may have a mission where you want to go right now, and that's fantastic. But as you go and you see more, the more you fly, the more you experience, the more the other 28 sectors you see, you may branch out. But at some point, you'll find your line, and that's the direction you're going. But you have to meet those. You have to meet those requirements to be able to move into the next the next job. Yeah, on that real quick before we go to Melissa, Christine, it, does that apply in your area too? I mean, you guys, your missions vary, and and you guys have to land on highways and things like that. So, is is knowing the territory a factor uh, in terms of uh, hiring and that type of thing? I wouldn't say that it's a it's again it's a nice to have if you know the area but eventually you will know your area when you're at your base long enough. So for us, it, I mean, for me, having been here now for 12 years at the same base, which, oh, by the way, is not far from my home. So it's the perfect combination. Um, when we get a call out, we have what, about a, a 20 minute anywhere, 30 minute anywhere normal radius to go to pick them up. And I know where that is from the minute they say, where the call is coming from. So, so yeah, it's wonderful for me and it's wonderful for, for my job to know the area. And it took a while for me to, to become that familiar. Um, but I do want to go back a little bit about our building. So things have shifted a little bit to say that when I was coming up and in your position, that it was either Tours or the Gulf of Mexico. Those were the two big hour builders. And I chose the Gulf of Mexico. I didn't do tours, so I don't really have anything to, to speak to you on that. But the Gulf was phenomenal. I mean, my, my time there was so important to learn confidence with my decision making um, because it's just me and my client in the helicopter. So the words of wisdom that were given to me are just a crack up when I finally got released from training. I said, okay, boss, do you have any words for me? He goes, yeah, don't break anything. And that was it. Right. It wasn't, you know, be aware of the weather, be aware of the temperature dew point or anything like that. But that's what came of it when I went to the Gulf of Mexico. And I just I couldn't be thankful enough for that. What time. was it yeah. like flying out to oil rigs? Um, fantastic. Right. Because it was just me and the helicopter sometimes and me, me, the helicopter and the client. And it was it was the best fun I could have. Somebody else was paying for the fuel and the maintenance. I mean, we'd just go anywhere. <laughs> so uh, some days it would be hopping from toadstool to toadstool. They call that the, the one spike platforms where they just go down and they, they service the area and then they go to the next one that's about five miles away and the next one. And it's an all day out there. So it's very peaceful. You better bring a book. Um, also, it, Sometimes you get stuck out there, so you better be willing to, you know, pack a bag and, and camp out wherever you are. But it how was many hours did you fly uh, on, you know, average uh, daily or monthly or whatever? About 80 hours a month. And it was a two week on, two week off. So, I mean, it was intense flying. But then we went to, so there's production where it's doing what I'm talking about, or it's drilling and then it's just a crew change every two weeks. Okay. Out and back again. So, production was definitely more of an hour builder than, than drilling. Um, and it was so much fun. It was just you and your client in the helicopter and off you go. It was great. And then flying the bigger aircraft that were IFR capable into the 139 or the, they had a giant 92 with all sorts of really fun aircraft. Only a couple did I get to fly. <laughs> uh, so I, I had a chance to visit the home of Louisiana, which is a, a major area for that. And, yeah. and, and they have, they had barracks and that type of thing. So did you, did you actually have to stay on duty, on call or whatever? How did that work? When I first started to fly, there are two things I said I would never do. I would never live in El Paso and I'd never live in a trailer. I've done both. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, yeah, when I was in the Gulf of Mexico, depending upon where you were, they would either have apartments or trailers. And we lived in a little complex in Fouchon, Louisiana. And it was all a series of, you know, 20, 20 little uh, happily I got my own trailer sometimes it was wonderful um, but it, 14 hour days five in the morning seven at night that was your day and they wow. could use you or not use you and sometimes you flew all day and sometimes you didn't fly at all 
Yeah. Did you uh, did you develop a taste for crawfish? <laughs> oh, honey, I sure did. Yeah, dinner in every ditch. I tell you, they can cook anything down there, and it's delicious. Yeah, that was that was my introduction to it. I believe it or not, I hadn't had crawfish prior to then. Uh, so, I, as I digress about food, <laughs> Melissa, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Your your background is interesting too. You uh, you studied. Uh, uh, helicopter flying, uh, and you did that starting a few years back. Um, I think you said in 2014. And you, so you, you've got a Bachelor of Science degree in Aviation Administration uh, at Utah Valley University. How did you choose that as a as your particular major, and and how did you get into to helicopter flying? And then now you work as an analyst for Aeronav Data. So I mean, you've had quite a variance there. I have. Uh, I came to flying a little bit later in life than some. I had a career in banking and I started looking at flying helicopters, realized it was very expensive. So I needed a way to pay for that. I already had a bachelor's in communication. So the flight school that I connected with in St. Louis ha um, had a relationship with Utah Valley and had a way of you enroll there to get your degree. And then you could also use your student loan money to fly. So that's how I ended up with uh, my aviation degree. It has helped me. Um, there are some pilots that I've talked to that say don't get degrees in aviation. There are classes that I know have made me a better pilot. Um, and I've worked full time through all of this. Uh, so I would, when I was in banking, I, I kind of got bored with that and got burned out on it. And through networking, as I think Jeff said earlier, it was, you know, network, network, network. I found Aeronav Data and they hire pilots. They hire mostly pilots with instrument ratings. Um, so that's how I became an analyst because we work with the instrument charts and information communications, airspace all day, every day. So it really pays off to be a pilot and have that background for my job. So what is it that you, you like to do at this from this point or at, at some point with your career? I still want to be uh, getting paid to fly at some point. I'm working on my CFI right now, so I'm finishing that up. I would like to fly in Alaska. After that, I'm, I'm not sure. I know I want to fly helicopters. There's a few different parts of the industry that interest me, but you know, I'm open to ideas. So what, what interests you and why Alaska, by the way? When I finished college, when I finished my communication degree, I worked in travel and was in Alaska and got to go on a helicopter glacier tour. And I've always remembered that and that experience. And I fell in love with Alaska when I went and I want to go back and get to spend some more time there. Um, I don't know that it would be long term flying up there, but yeah. So would you like to fly glacier tours? Yes. <laughs> Panelists, do you guys have any advice about that? I, I know someone else that fell in love this almost the exact same way, but in Hawaii, went on a tour to in Hawaii and uh, found out that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. So um, who is Jamie Foster, if you haven't uh, already met her, uh, that was the way she found out and it was her second career. And I see that a lot in aviation, especially in, in helicopters. But for some reason, I see it a lot with women that are, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and I think it's just a, a point in your life where you may be able, you have money or you've been working and have a little money saved up or, or know how to uh, get a loan. But uh, I think a lot of people start that way. And that's a, I think it's a great goal. I, I love seeing, um, you know, I, I love seeing more and more people. Uh, I, I'm seeing a lot more people interested in utility and firefighting these days as well. So uh, Alaska run tours, um, you know, I think power line patrol. There's a, there are so many um, interests and everything, uh, every job you can uh, have in this industry is a, is a complete and total skill in and of itself. So I, 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 I'm sure there's some Alaska pilots uh, that are hanging around that we can talk to and see how, how you can get up there eventually. So skills, speaking of that, you were a test pilot for Sikorsky. What, what was that like? 
Um, I was a production test. Uh, I was a production test pilot, um, mainly for Sikorsky's commercial line of products, um, which overwhelmingly it was the Sikorsky 76 and the uh, Sikorsky 92 aircraft. So, um, you know, they make a lot more helicopters than that, but I was on the commercial side of the production line. Sure. And basically what the job is, is uh, when the helicopter is built and <laughs> off of the line, um, the general job is you take it out, uh, you check it in the hangar the first time it's ever been, uh, you know, had hangar checks in a pre-flight. You push it out and do it the very first grounds that aircraft has ever done, and then you go and do the flights. Um, and occasionally I did, um, I did get to sit in with some experimental test pilots and do a few of those flights as well. Um, and my job was uh, is quite a variety because I also got to instruct um, pilots that came to pick up their newly delivered aircraft. Or sometimes I got to fly at home with them and train them in, in their home locations. So all over the world. So it was a great job. Yeah, highly recommended job. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Connor, I was going to come back to you and ask now with everything that you've heard, is there any particular aspect of helicopter flying that you, you think you might focus on at this point? Um, I think I'll continue through my CF or CFI track as of right now. I know I've talked to a few of the Canadian recruiters and they were saying that you might not necessarily get a flight position. And if I can't get a flight position, I don't really want to join. So I would continue going through with my uh, CFI, hopefully go up through my double I, uh, hopefully work here in Prescott as a CFI for a while. And then I'd like to branch out somewhere else and go tours. I'd like to go somewhere weird. I'd like to do contracting overseas. I was just uh, at the Heli Expo in, uh, or not Heli Expo, sorry, the Robinson uh, Safety Course in Torrance. And I met a couple people down there and they kind of told me a little bit about contracting overseas, flying a, I believe it was Chinooks in Afghanistan. So something like that, that would be something that I kind of want to look into, but also just explore all those other militaries as well and kind of call some people. And I don't know, there, there's so many ways to go that I just kind of want to feel a little bit of everything before, you know, finding, picking one that I really want to go to. So. So I have two questions for our panelists too, uh, about international flying. If any of you've had experience about that, of flying overseas and, and what you would make a recommendation on that. The other one is flying for something like the National Guard, um, where it's, it's kind of a part-time gig, uh, which allows you to also build hours and, and uh, stay uh, flying while you're working on other aspects of your career. Can you guys give some insight about that? Uh, I do have um, international flying experience. I know it's not a, uh, you know, for a, an American pilot, it's uh, besides the international contract flying jobs, there aren't a lot of American pilots that go overseas, but there are a lot of, um, in the UAE, in the Middle East, um, in, in Africa, in different parts of the world, there are uh, specific contract flying jobs that you can get. And, and that is, uh, it's usually coupled with certain companies that are out there that do that. And, and they'll take uh, a lot of international pilots from, from Canada, from Australia, from France, um, from all over, and you'll be flying all together in one location. I think I've met a lot of CHC pilots when I went to Azerbaijan and I was delivering an aircraft there. Um, we were flying there and I met a lot of pilots and they were from all over. So there are opportunities, it's just, um, there, you have to dig a little deeper to find those international opportunities. But yes, they're out there, definitely. And, uh, and the best way uh, to find them is to ask. So I think GAL, um, there are a lot of companies out there. And you know, through times and harder times and easier times, they'll change names and the companies change uh, you know, locations and names and, and the job profile. But they're still out there. And a lot of people love that kind of work. So. Um, that's definitely one of the many opportunities out there. But uh, for, yeah, inter I think that's probably your best bet for international flying. Okay, and, and both Jeff and Stacy, any, any thoughts about the National Guard versus the uh, a regular branch of the service? Uh, well, I, I know quite a few people that are actually still in the National Guard. A, a lot of people go in the military, uh, active duty, spend a couple of years in there to fulfill their requirement. 
and then they go and then they get out of active duty and go in the National Guard or the reserves. Um, I think it's very rewarding. Um, it's uh, so I, I have a son that's also in aviation. Uh, he flies airplanes. I want him to fly helicopters. And I tried to talk him into going in the Army. He was in the reserves. He was a Black Hawk mechanic. And I tried to get him to go to flight school. And he's already flying airplanes. And his only, the only drawback that he had in this scenario was going to flight school takes a long, it takes about two years out of where you are right now to stop your life and go uh, like in the army, what he would have done, he would have went down to Fort Rucker, Alabama and did you know two years of flight school and officer training and all that stuff. So that's the reason he didn't do it. But, but I think um, I have a lot of friends that are retired National Guard and have been in the National Guard uh, and they, abs they absolutely loved it because they got to do both. They got to do the civilian side and then, you know, a couple, uh, couple weekends or a couple nights um, a month, they used to, they could go, put, go back in the Black Hawk and all that other military stuff. It was quite rewarding. Stacy, how about you? Any perspective on that? Um, well, I was uh, active duty for my entire career and I, I chose not to uh, go into the National Guard or the reserves. Um, and I, I was just, I couldn't wait to get into the civilian industry. Um, but yeah, I, I, to do it all over again, or maybe to continue on and with a National Guard unit, I think through my progression, uh, getting to where I was going, I think, as Jeff said, it's, it's satisfying. People find a sense of purpose in it. And I think that's a similarity with helicopter pilots is that every one of our jobs serves a purpose. And we seem to be people who are looking um, uh, to serve a purpose. So I think it, it helps us when our job is meaningful to others. So I think that that's just one of the characteristics I see is that we're all related, we're connected by. So it's, it's interesting. Um, we're, we're all trying to find our, our niche and, uh, and the guard is definitely one of those very fulfilling positions as Jeff said. Great, thanks. Uh, Melissa, we'll start with you as we start to wrap things up. Do you have any questions uh, regarding your career path and interests? Uh, do any of the panelists have any advice for, I know that these are times that none of us have really experienced, but I think Christine, you said you started flying right out around 9-11 to, do you have any advice to those of us that are younger as far as maybe parts of the industry to look at, to build hours and to get into it? So like I said, there were two options when I was in your shoes and it was Gulf of Mexico or tours and tours, I, I don't know why I didn't do tours. I, I think Gulf of Mexico just called me. Um, a lot of time over the water, but I, it was amazing flying out there. I don't know, Stacy, of the, of the 29 things that are out there, are, <laughs> are there others that are, are strong builders for time? Because those are the only two that I can still yeah. hard to do. I I think some of the some of the jobs that are that you'll find available is we still need to eat, right? Agriculture is a big one. I think uh, if you look in uh, what is it, Black Hills? There there are a number of um, I run into them at the uh, at the Heli Expo all the time. There are people that are looking to fill positions, and they're not fancy. They are purposeful positions in agriculture. There's cherry drying. Um, there's spraying, of course. Um, Got, there are uh, photo uh, flight opportunities, tours, charter. Um, uh, and then as you're building your time, um, electronic news gathering. Um, let's see, I can run the gamut, but oil and gas, uh, there are law enforcement jobs, public safety, firefighting, utility, heavy lift. Um, was writing a few as we were talking. Uh, government jobs, um, Screen Actors Guild film production, power line patrol, search and rescue. Aerial cattle herding, um, international contract flying, instructing, of course. Um, there, there are so many out there. I think that you're going to find as you meet people going to events and networking with other people, you're going to uncover places and jobs that you never knew existed. So they're out there. And I think that they're going to pop up in front of you as you meet somebody. You may not know exactly you know, which job you're going for, you might stumble on it and just leave the doors open and then be open to opportunities. Yeah, but networking is key. 
Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. networking is key. But as far as our rebuilding, would you think that the, the golf and the tours would be stronger in that way? Or I don't know. Yeah, I think those are the two main ones there. Um, on the in-between, when you're, when you're a CFI or when you're instructing and times are slow, I would look at the cherry drying and the agriculture work, the seasonal <laughs> And, the, and there's the opportunities uh, on on season in certain areas of the world where they're just hiring a seasonal pilot for tours. So there's definitely opportunities. And, and that's what you're going to find in Alaska. We, we have a lot of people up in the Northeast that that was one of their, uh, one of their progression pieces was they would, they were doing instruction in the Northeast and then they would fly out to Alaska and there's a couple of tour companies and they actually have really good training programs for the transition from the recip to the to the turbine, and you do a season out there with them, they put you up on the house. They, it's not the greatest pay in the world, but you see some of the most majestic uh, landscapes in the world. So, uh, but it, but it's a great transition from recip to to uh, turbine, and then they would come back and do a tour job or an ENG job if they had that turbine time and four months they're there doing tours they probably build 300 hours so it's it's uh I, i've known a lot of people that do that transition but but stacy's right there's a lot of there's a lot of in-between jobs so and the fact that you're a cfi double i and you're, you're in the you're in the robbie and you already went to this because you're an instructor you have to go to the safety course which is usually a requirement to go out and do any of these other jobs that are done in robinson's but there's a lot of that stuff there's a lot of unique stuff out there. And, and as Stacy said, the more you see uh, of all those other different segments of the industry, you, you eventually find the one that's right for you. Great. Thank you, Jeff and Stacy um, and Christine. So Connor, uh, do you have, have any other questions of, that pertain to your career that you'd like to ask at this point? Um, one other thing is I know with a lot of those, um, the heavier lift kind of jobs, like what Ericsson does and Columbia and all that kind of stuff, they'll take you on, but you start off with just SIC. Is that, how does that affect you going into like a different job afterwards? Because are people looking at SIC or are they only really looking for those PIC hours? Jeff? I, I, you know, experience is, is golden, I think, no matter in what form. And, and once again, I would talk to anyone that, that seemed to, I don't know, I'm not aware of anyone who got caught in the trap that they didn't have enough PIC time, but uh, that could very, very well, uh, it's definitely worthwhile to talk to people that are doing those jobs. I know there's a big picture going around um, of one of the heavy lift pilots being very young and, um, is that a job where you get trapped into a, I think the experience um, that you get from that would probably outweigh the fact that it's not PIC time because as you're coming up, normally you're flying a single engine, single piloted helicopter. Uh, you're getting into a twin early. So I'm sure that there's a pro there's, there are pros and cons of each, each route people go. Um, but I know a lot, not everyone just does the CFI route although it's a very good route to go. Uh, you learn a lot in the process and, and, uh, and CFI is, is, is the normal way in the United States to, um, to advance, but it, uh, it's not the normal way in Canada. So uh, being that SIC is probably your next step or is definitely an option for you as well as other pilots as well. So. And, and I, I agree. I don't think uh, hiring in a, in a, and I think in our career, we've hired, we went through the hiring process a lot. And I don't think I've ever spent a lot of time on PIC, SIC. It's, it's a lot of total time and then we drop right down in, you know, IFR time's big depending on what job you're gonna get. And then it really goes down to what type of experience by the companies and what segment you've worked at. Um, the people that I know that go into those heavy lift logging utility jobs, I don't think they're trapped there. I think they go there and they never leave. Um, I think if you if you would go up to Oregon and stuff like that and go see those companies, those guys have been there for decades and they absolutely love their job. And you know, but remember, it's it's all for what you want to do. They're you know the jeans and flannel shirts. They love the camping. You know they can they bring their own coffee pot along and they spend the whole you know their whole shift out in 
in the tundra. So uh, I, yeah, I don't think they're trapped there. I think they know something that we don't. Well, that sounds lovely. I'm, I'm all for that. Well said. Um, Summer, last but not least, do you have a question? And Summer, this is what's great about this webcast is that while, we're, while we've been talking, someone actually told Summer that they have a connection for her with one of the news gathering operations in Los Angeles. So yeah. now she, she, her networking begins. <laughs> hey, awesome. Yeah, really grateful for that connection already. I'm looking forward to reach out. Um, yeah, I don't think I have many questions. This was so amazing, great um, information and yeah, I'm so, ex I'm so excited to keep connecting and excited for Heli Expo again. I can't wait for March. <laughs> Great. Well, as we wrap things up, any word to the wise for these aspiring young aviation professionals? We'll start with Jeff. Uh, yeah, I just want everybody to know, uh, I, we, we've had the conversation with the panelists, but everybody else, that prior to COVID, I know these are, are, these are tough times and people are wondering, what, you know, if they spend all this money on getting helicopter ratings and they're not going to be able to use it. Uh, prior to COVID, I would say February, January, I was doing more meetings about uh, workforce uh, integration and how we were going to fill the gap with the pilot shortage. Um, that pilot shortage still exists. Um, of course, the, we have to get through this COVID mess. But I think once we, we get through it and everything gets back to somewhat normal, you're going to find yourself uh, back. We're going to find ourselves back where we were uh, pre-COVID with that shortage. So don't uh, don't give up. Keep your chin up, and and uh, this will this will be over. And and enjoy your career. Great, thank you, Christine. Um, sorry, I was actually listening to his words. <laughs> uh, there is no bad experience and everything builds on itself. You can't keep your, keep your options open and keep networking. It will all, I, and then when you of course do figure out what you wanna do, charge for it, really. Just keep going, charge hard. As in like, keep going hardly. Don't, don't, don't charge people money for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Stacy, oh, I, I have to say this too before I, before I go to Stacy. Um, I'm a, I'm this, a, this has been a pretty, you know, kind of the one of those se semi-serious things about career and stuff like that. But I think any of you guys know that helicopter pilots are anything but serious. I mean, seriously. Am I right? <laughs> that goes for all pilots and everybody in aviation, but I just have to pick on these guys anyhow. Stacy, take us home. Okay. Well, I think the, the biggest thing, and of course, that's that's what I'm chairing this year, HAI, is uh, we're looking to get through this. I mean, 9-11, COVID's making 9-11, um, comparatively, uh, you know, in the delays and getting back to everybody's normal way of business, of course, it's just going to take much longer, but stick with it. I mean, if it's your passion and you love it and you know you're not going to be complete without uh, doing one of these jobs where a helicopter is part of it, then keep, keep with it. And, and the big thing is, like Christine said, um, network, uh, talk to people. That is the biggest thing in this industry is that we all know each other and we all are connected by the same passions. Uh, so we're, we're quite passionate about it. So Heli Expo in March in New Orleans, we are full on, full forward. So uh, you can get ready, book your tickets and, and get set because I don't think anything's going to stop us from going, you know, barring some other crazy, crazy thing. But by next late spring, I think we're ready uh, to come out and see our friends again. I think it's it's been a long time now, and so we're looking. And it's going to be in New Orleans. Hope to see you there. I said it's it's, it's no, going to be right? in New Orleans, yeah. <laughs> which will make it even that much more fun. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'd like to thank everyone for, for participating in this uh, and, and being available. For you aspiring young aviation professionals, I hope that you found it uh, enlightening about what you can do with your career. And I'd like to thank uh, you, you pros for taking the time to uh, shed some insight and, and uh, some light on, on what opportunities exist and options are out there and that type of thing. So 
On behalf of the Bob Hoover Foundation, on behalf of our president, Tracy Forrest, and our chairman, Michael Herman, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and look forward to catching up with you guys again next week. You guys take care, fly safe. <laughs> you too.